But I wanted to start by reading out of Proverbs for you. It's Proverbs chapter 1, and it's verses 8 and 9. It says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't reject your mother's teaching, for they will be a garland of favor on your head and pendants around your neck. So obviously we have Mother's Day today, and we said Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, but the best mom wasn't here yet. So uh, Happy Mother's Day to uh, everybody. And as well, uh, I always, with that, want to say, too, if anybody is someone who's not able to have kids, um, I know that today is a difficult day, and that can be challenging for you or for your friends like that, so uh, we express our empathy towards that. If you have friends, make sure you share that in the hope of Christ with them as well. So, happy Mother's Day, and uh, I wanted to dive into here, we're going to start looking at Leviticus chapter 19. And we're going to be in chapter 19 for a few weeks. And chapter 19 is smack dab in the middle of this section of scripture that we've been looking at here, of chapters 18 through 20. And chapter 19 is uh, it's a really good peek into the heart of God. So I hope at this point through Leviticus, people are past the part where I say Leviticus and there's a bad taste in your mouth. And it sounds uh, boring. But uh, it, it is amazing how relevant it is to us. And chapter 19 is almost like um, a, a social justice chapter. And it is one of the chapters that Jesus is most famous in quoting. That's where we get the phrase, uh, love your neighbor as yourself from, is from chapter 19. And so I want to just kind of slowly go through that. And as we do that, Chapter 19 is going to point out to us the responsibility of, uh, there is our uh, responsibility in relationship with other people, and then there's also this responsibility relationship and dedication to God and the pursuit of holiness, and chapter 19 is a collision course of those two, and it's going to show us that those two things were never meant to be separated, and it's one thing that... Striving to be holy like God is holy will affect all of the relationships around you. It will affect your relationship with your family. It's going to affect your relationship with work. It's going to affect your relationship with the court system, with all these different things. So as we look at chapter 19, we're going to go through each of those. And I think that it should cause us each time to pause and reflect and think about how we are living out what God has told Israel he expects of them. Uh, I was thinking about the fact, you know, that we were created as image bearers of God. And sometimes people kind of go down a wacky route with that. But really what that means is that it's almost like we're a billboard, a walking billboard to demonstrate to the world God. And so when we are presenting ourselves to other people, my question is, how are we presenting that? I was thinking of like, uh, if you've ever been to like a carnival, you know, they have like the mirrors, you go to the house, and the mirrors, and one makes you look really tall, and one makes you look really short, um, one makes you look fat, one makes you look thin, and it distorts the image of you, um, and for everyone under 40, my original analogy was, uh, it's like a Snapchat filter, um, and it makes you have a dog face, um, but it changes the way that you appear, right? So when we are projecting God's heart to people, are we projecting an accurate depiction of who God is, or are we depicting a dog face, Snapchat filter of God, um, that covers up who he is and what his heart is? And so when we do this, the, the main idea here of the first couple verses of Leviticus 19 is that our daily life should demonstrate God's holiness and love. That should be love that we're showing to other people. And so we continue to look at the question, just keep repeating it, hoping maybe you guys will remember a uh, year from now, but it's, you know, how can sinful people like me and like you, how can we worship and live for the Holy God, the Almighty? And the text here this morning starts out, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. So the Lord spoke to Moses. He told Moses, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that is the phrase that we keep hearing repeated over and over again throughout uh, Leviticus. And in fact, you know, Jesus echoes the same sentiment when he tells people uh, in Matthew 5, 
it says to be, depending on translation, to say be mature or be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is mature or perfect, or really the word is to be complete. Um, so it's, you know, God is holy, which means he's entirely set apart. He's on a different level than us, um, completely different, and he is complete. And Jesus is saying that as we mature in our faith, that we should strive to be complete and continue to grow more and more like Christ. So God has commanded us to be holy, and that holiness that we're going to see in chapter 19 is really a condition of our heart. That, um, you know, our natural state is sinners who are separated from God and without any hope. In this life, without any hope in the next life. And um, any type of holiness that we are going to demonstrate in our relationships to other people is going to come because of the change of hearts that God is working in us. Cutting out that heart of stone and, and giving us a heart of flesh. Demonstrating to people the hope that we have. So as we look at that, one of the ways which we can demonstrate God's holiness is explained in verses 3 through 4, where it says, Each of you is to respect his mother and father. You are to keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make cast images of gods for yourself. I am the Lord your God. So the first thing, just to point out, and uh, it, you know, it's Mother's Day, so it's perfect, is that it says here to respect his mother and father. Listing the mom first is practically unheard of in ancient Near Eastern literature or codes. So the fact that when God, we're going to talk about how this sounds a lot like the fifth commandment, um, and that says father and mother, but here he says mother and father, it just goes to demonstrate that while God has given us unique roles in life, that God has a very high view of the beauty of his creation in both men and women. And that mothers are of equal importance to fathers. Um, do I even know but <laughs> we, see, we see that, right? So it's so cool to me to see, you know, this archaic, old, outdated, 4,000-year-old book being way ahead of the curve of women's rights, of putting mothers first in this. And then, like I said, it really sounds a lot like Exodus 20, 12, which is the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What I think is interesting, and as I was really diving into this, was I, I looked to see what the words here were in Hebrew for those two things. Is it just a repeat, or is it adding something different? And what's interesting is, here in Leviticus 19, uh, most English translations say each of you is to respect his mother and father. That word respect is uh, yarehu, and it literally means to fear. So it's to guard with feelings of respect, with reverence, to consider something hallowed, or to exalt it, to be in awe of it. So when you hear people say to fear God, um, it's that respect that is tied up to that well we sing that God is for us we also recognize that God is uh, awesome and it would be terrifying of how incredible he is and that there is this respect that we pay for him and that healthy fear of God of who he is and that is what this is telling us it says that each person should fear their mother and father now um I don't know about you guys, but I got a few spankings when I was growing up, um, and I was scared of them. My mom's favorite phrase, and I thought about this when I was writing this, was if I was acting up in public, she would very loudly tell me that she would whoop me here in front of God and everybody. <laughs> she doesn't care what people think. Um, that usually got me pretty straight at that point. But every now and then she then would follow up and whoop me right there in front of God and everybody. Um, I don't know how well that would go over, you know, 20 years later now, spanking your kid in the middle of the aisle a Kroger. But uh, it really keep you in line there. So there was this healthy fear of that relationship, right? But what's interesting is that Exodus 20, the fifth commandment, the word that is used there. Um, is different, and it's better translated as, like, honor. So both words sometimes are translated as respect, 
or honor in the English language, but they're very different. So when we look at this context, the big picture of the Old Testament, we see that our parents are to be honored and they're to be feared for more than just spankings that they might hand out to us. Um, so we look at that, and I thought it was even more interesting when I started reading that because when I sent out the announcement video that I'm sure you guys watched a few times to make sure you soaked in every detail, um, we looked at 1 Peter. And this passage here from 1 Peter 2.17 that tells us to submit to human authority. And he says here that um, in verse 16 it says, Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. And then it says, Fear God. Honor the emperor. And so the Greek version of the Old Testament, the New Testament's written in Greek, Old Testament was translated into Greek, and so the Greek version, it uses these same words here. So when it says, fear God, uh, they use the same Greek word as Leviticus 19. So it's saying to fear God, respect with fear. And then it says to honor the emperor, and that word is the same as the fifth commandment, that we should honor our mother and father. And I had my, kind of, my mind started kind of rolling then, thinking about the fact that so the relationships there where we are called to fear God in the relationship we have with him. And then he also tells us to honor the emperor. And I think I kind of made a comment in passing in the video that, you know, Peter is writing this about an emperor who is murdering Christians. They are hunting down Christians to take away their life for worshiping. And his answer to that is to honor the emperor. So how does that idea of honoring people that uh, you might have a slight disagreement with them trying to feed us to lions. How do you honor someone like that, and how do you fear God, and how are both of those things applied to respecting our parents, or those in charge of us? So as we look at that, we see throughout the Old Testament these examples of how we should adhere to our parents' wisdom, not to reject their teaching, and that often I think is very hard for us, because to, to listen to our parents requires us to put aside our favorite item, which is the worship of ourself, the pride of ourself, that we know the best way to do things. Um, and I, I guess I can't really use my kids as an analogy since they're sitting here. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, obviously, you know, I think my kids are very well behaved, but there are times where... Um, Especially Titus, man. You like to talk back every now and then, right? Yeah? Oh, I'm getting mean bugs. He's, he's mean bugging me. Anyway, my point is there that it is hard for us because Titus is learning how to do lots of things on his own. He wants to dress himself. He wants to uh, make breakfast for himself. And those are great things. But every now and then, we need to interfere and help train him. And it's hard to set aside our pride that we think we can do things on our own and listen to our parents' advice. So as we do that, I, I think the idea here, the main idea is that our parents are really the first relationship that we have in life. It's the first bonding and interaction and commitment and trust that we build in our life. So what is God teaching us through that? What is he growing in us? And like I said, I think really it's the idea of suspending our worship of ourselves and submitting to someone that is above us and in charge of us and teaching us God's heart on how things work, the way that we should submit to God. And so we are called to both fear and love our parents, fear and honor them, which made me think of the advice of a great sage, uh, Michael Scott, who once said, would I rather be feared or loved? Easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love them. Um, so we should be afraid of how much we love our parents and how much we honor them. And the New Testament uh, is just chock full of this as well. So we see Jesus repeating the sentiment here in Matthew 15. We see the interaction that Jesus has with his own mom. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, when he's praying, he says, hey, if there's any other way, uh, let's go that route. But, you know, if not, then I submit to your will, Father. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul writes um, in Colossians 3 that 
parents, children should obey your parents because it pleases the Lord. In Ephesians 6, it says that children should obey your parents, honor your father and mother so that you have a long life. But then it goes on to point out that fathers shouldn't exasperate our kids, that we should um, help our kids learn how to respect us. So the application of this is what I wanted to hone in on here. And like I said, this is a nice, easy lesson. Uh, we hit the two of the most controversial topics the past two weeks, so it's a little light this week. Um, and it's so straightforward. I kept looking at this and saying, all right, so where's this deep thing? We've got to make this mind-blowing. Um, but it turns out sometimes scripture is just super, super easy to understand. Uh, we often just don't like the parts that are easy to understand because they confront us with our need to follow God's heart. So I want to point out that this passage of fearing and respecting your parents has a lot to do with more than just your parents. That uh, this shows the heart of the law here. The heart that uh, we should do what God says of us and we should hold these relationships the way that God tells us. That we should put others above ourselves and we should be willing to submit to people that are above us. And um, One important thing here is that, and I think every parent in the room would agree with this, and I feel like I've given my kids this talk over and over again, is when we teach our kids to respect us and to fear us, um, that helps them to honor that relationship and respect us, which helps them learn to honor and respect other adults that are in charge of them, to honor and respect teachers, to honor and respect your first boss, to honor and respect the government, to honor and respect God. So it builds one on top of the other, and it's such a simple idea of teaching someone how to respect. But it's something that we just have to remind ourselves that as parents, it is our duty to teach kids to respect us. And I wanted to look at here just the different roles that we might be in today. So the, the first thing here is that practically, so the answer is, how does this apply if you're a kid? Um, so I don't mean like you have to be like three years old, but you're the child in the relationship. You don't have kids yet, but you have parents or you have adults that are guardians of you. And so how do you apply this? You respect your parents. Um, it's just flat out that simple of respecting them. And it's important because this is the commandment that has a promise attached to it. The promise that if you respect your parents, that things will go well there in that area. And I think that's because two reasons. One, when we fear and honor our parents, it pleases God because that is what he told us to do. It's an act of worship to honor your parents. Um, and then two, your life just goes a lot easier if you honor your parents. Right, Reagan? She's so mad. Um, so, yeah, it just goes a lot easier for that. So it's a fact of worshiping God, and it's a fact of um, life is easier when you're not arguing all the time and being stubborn. So that's pretty straightforward. Kids, obey your parents. Now, the question is, what if I'm an adult now? So um, if you are an adult who has children, what is, or even if you don't have children, but you, know, you have kids, what is the application of this if you're an adult? It's to respect your parents. Um, so the thing there is, is that one, we have to instruct our children. Like Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, says that, um, you know, it is the parent's responsibility to raise that child according to God's standard, how he wants things to be done. And honestly, sometimes it can be really difficult because a lot of times it takes a lot of patience to instill that respect. Sometimes it's just easier to just let them go ahead and have that extra piece of candy. Um, sometimes it's easier when they're throwing a fit to just be like, all right, well, okay, so let's just stop crying and apologize, and then, yeah, then you can do this. It's so much easier sometimes to just let kids get away with whatever. Um, and that's something we have to work on, making sure that we're consistent and that we stick with it um, and that we support one another in that. 
And the other thing I wanted to point out about if, if you're the adult now is um, one of the most important ways that you are going to teach your children how to respect their parents is by demonstrating it. And so my question is, when we interact with our parents, people who have kids, keep in mind you are training the people who are going to be your caregiver when you're old. Um, so do you want your kids treating you the way that you're treating your parents? Do you want them to be treating you the way that you're treating your parents? You are training your children who are watching you, watching us, on how we respect and honor our parents. We have to keep that in mind that um, later even in Leviticus chapter 19, it even says that the Israelites are required to rise in the presence of the elderly and to honor the old. That God has set it forth that we're to respect people who are older than us. So adults, respect your parents. And then the third category, which is uh, you know, a little more complicated, is the question is, what if my parents don't deserve respect? The answer is, respect your parents. Um, so what if your parents don't deserve respect. We're still called to respect them even if they don't deserve it. And, and so while this, this passage is super simple, super straightforward, it was something that was kind of hard for me because I often deal with questioning myself if I am doing the right thing and how I have a, no relationship with my parents right now. Am I respecting them in that? Am I a hypocrite to stand up here and tell you guys to respect your parents? teach your kids to respect their parents and respect your, the grandparents? Is that hypocrisy to stand up here and do that? So I wanted to kind of look at that and take an exam with you because um, I would go out on a limb and say probably everybody here has somewhat of an issue with their parents um, because I'm the only perfect parent. So everyone else probably has that. Um, but as we go through that, it's important to remember that flat out at the end of the day, God told us to respect them, and so we have to. And as we continue to look at this, the very basic idea of the grace of salvation is if we've tasted the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of Christ, we have no choice but to share that with other people around us. That as we are image bearers, if we've experienced that grace and that mercy, we should be reflecting that off of us and showing God's heart to people especially the people that don't deserve it. And so we know here that it's that grace, that unearned, the fact that Christ came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again. And that he gives that faith as a gift to us and saves us is why we're able to demonstrate grace to other people. So, what, what I'll say here is I think there's four important clarifications on what we do when we feel like it's hard to honor our parents or honor our grandparents, or truly, this would apply to any type of authority that is in our life. So what do we do when we feel like the authority doesn't deserve our respect? So one, the first thing is, is that we need to distinguish the difference between honor and obedience. So those two can go hand in hand, like... My kids should obey me because that is a way of honoring me. But um, there are times where clearly parents do things that are sinful, that God forbids. And so there is a right way and there is a wrong way to not just go along with whatever legal action. So like if your dad came to you and was like, hey, we're going to rob a bank today. You should come along and do this. I need someone to drive the car. You can respectfully tell your dad, I'm going to choose not to commit a felony today. Um, so we have the ability to rightfully disagree and not obey if it's violating what God's commandment is. And so it's the same thing we talked about in you know, that reference video, is that we have authority over us, and so we have the ability to disobey if someone is promoting evil or hindering good, but we can do so in an honoring way. Kind of along that same line is the fact that we can distinguish between honor and agreement. 
So just because you honor your parents doesn't mean that you're co-signing on the ideas that they present. Um, and I thought one great example as I was kind of looking through um, this topic was the analogy of, you know, what if, for example, your parents are racist? And, you know, it's just every conversation. It's like, you know, the crazy uncle at Thanksgiving. And for some reason, during dinner, he has to bring up something about people of a different race or people of a different political group or this or that. So honoring your parents and not screaming at them at the dinner table um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're agreeing with them. I think sometimes we feel, especially in like the world where I can just get my phone out and I can put my thoughts out there for everyone to read right this second, we feel like everybody needs to hear our opinion right away. Um, and if we don't, then we're kind of passively going along with that, right? Well, that's wrong. There is wisdom in being slow to speak and quick to hear. I have learned in relationships with people that are above me and the authority pull of, of parents and leaders is that, you know, some, sometimes there's just no point in arguing or even having the discussion. Sometimes it's okay to just let people speak their opinion just smile. Sometimes it's okay to not sit there and argue about it. No good has ever come of me arguing with some people um, on some ideas. So it's, it's important to submit to that and honor them. And then as well is we are able to, with that, when we, when we look more into this, we can distinguish the difference between um, the person and the office, the person and the positioning. So when we look at this, it's, you know, your mom, your dad, is your mom or dad. And the mere fact that they hold that position deserves respect. So you can honor the position while not necessarily agreeing with the way that person lives. So we think about David and King Saul, where, I mean, come on, he had every reason to go ahead and just execute King Saul. He probably could have won a self-defense case in court uh, because Saul was trying to hunt him down but what does he do? He cuts off a portion of Saul's robe, and then he even feels guilty about that because he has gone against the king, the one that God appointed. He is honoring that position. And it reminds me of one thing that we don't, I know with our kids, is he's trying to teach them to respect that position. And a great example is the president. So I don't need to show him this, but I guarantee that everybody in this room probably has a problem with either President Obama or President Trump, right? So there's a pretty good guess there that people have an issue with either of them or both of them, um, but we could feel like perhaps one of them or both of them, maybe you feel like they're not qualified for that job. Maybe you feel like they're a bad leader. Maybe you think they're taking us the wrong route. But at the end of the day, they're still the President of the United States, and that office deserve some honor, it deserves some respect. And so we, we make sure that we teach that even if we disagree with those decisions, we respect just because of the role that they hold. And that is how we should behave with our parents and with our bosses and with anyone who has authority over us. And then kind of the fourth part there is that there is a difference we can distinguish between honoring our parents and enabling our and I think this one right here kind of wraps up the other three into this idea. And again, I think often we worry about, and it's good to consider, but am I enabling, am I encouraging some kind of sinful behavior or lifestyle by respecting that person, by giving them honor? And, and the truth is that you don't have to cover up for other people sins. You don't have to help them make excuses or pretend like it's not there to honor them. You can still treat your parents with respect. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to share the story or not, but I will. So, um, I mean, but just me and my closest friends this morning. <laughs> Which, side note, it is really hard to preach when I cannot gauge your facial expressions. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, all I can judge is Chris's eyes just staring straight through me. Um, but, but yeah, anyway, this is a very interesting time. Let's give you a picture. Um, 
So, I share with you guys, obviously, this makes me reflect on the fact of my relationship with my parents. And um, so, one thing, it was interesting, I, I think Whitney and I talked about this week, nice stickers, um, that I asked her, I said, well, you know, I'm struggling with this. Do I, do I fear and honor my parents, my biological parents who gave me birth and at least let me help them pay the mortgage to live in their house with them growing up? Um, <laughs> That was an example of not honoring your parents. Um, and, and I said that in Whitney, um, it's nice to have someone that can give feedback into that. Like, Whitney pointed out, I used to trash them all the time. Um, because there was a lot of unforgiveness harboring in my heart because of that. And according to Whitney, I've gotten much better about that. Um, but it's, it's not going around and airing out people's dirty laundry. It's not going around and saying terrible things about them. Um, and I, I tried to like take an inventory here in my heart, like the way that I behaved before, the way that I'm behaving now, and all these things here. So distinguishing between the person and the office, being able to honor them without enabling them, being able to honor them. Um, so when I discovered um, that my dad decided to uh, crash my entire financial life, uh, I was like, 20. Um, and uh, I punched him right in the face. Mm. And I still regret that to this day. It's one of the things that just really wears on my heart. And uh, I know that I'm forgiven. And I've addressed that, but you know those things. And that is like the prime example of not honoring your parents <laughs> is, uh, yeah, clocking someone um, in the side of the head. But um, that was an honest failure and sin on my part, what, 12 years ago? Um, but then moving forward, going and, and addressing the issue and saying to them, I'm here to forgive you. Uh, you need to get yourself right with God because clearly things aren't right there. And so I am praying that God will forgive you and that he will open your heart to go closer to him. And then the door is open. And that's really hard. A couple times a year that really hits me. And I wonder what next steps are there. So we can honor them. I, you can honor them like I turned them into the police for what they did. And there's an honorable way to do that versus going around and blasting it on Facebook or whatever else. We can send, give you these examples to point out that we can take correct steps and not enable and not excuse parents' poor actions. And I am betting at least all the adults in the room are thinking about one or two things your parents probably need uh, forgiveness for that we don't want to enable. But as we do that, we can do that in a Christ-like manner. So we can learn from those past mistakes, and we can still honor them. And then as well, God puts other authority figures in your life. And so I often think about the way that I treat Whitney's parents, because they are my mom and dad, too. Like, I have a very close relationship with them, uh, probably more than most in-laws have, because... When I lost that relationship with my parents, they stepped in to be parents for me. Um, and so I, my conviction is that while I am honoring my biological parents by not know, trying to get revenge or trying to blast their business everywhere or whatever else, I can kind of passively honor them for that role. And then at the same time, I can actively honor Whitney's parents. That, like I said, sometimes, every now and then, we might disagree about something. Um, and how do we handle that disagreement? There are times to just be quiet. Um, there are times to thank them. There are times to consider that. And so we can take those relationships. Maybe your parents are no longer alive. Maybe your parents are not part of your life. There are still people in your life that deserve respect because they have a position higher than you. And I, I really believe that God has a start with respecting our parents to teach us how to be honorable to other people and to share the love of Christ with them. So I really just want to encourage you here. Um, I feel like I still have another 40 minutes. <laughs> um, I just want to encourage everyone here this morning. Um, it's Mother's Day, and um, it's the Lord's Day, and we dive into this. To think about how you are teaching your children respect, 
how you're demonstrating respect to your adult parents. If they're not around, how are you demonstrating respect to people who have authority over you? How are you demonstrating respect to the leaders um, of this church, of this community, this state, this country? Are we respecting people or are we just honoring them? That we should, the same way that we honor the emperor and fear God, we should have those same types of reactions to our parents. So, I want everybody to do that. I thought there'd be more kids here. I was going to have the kids give their mom a happy Mother's Day hug. Um, so, there you go. Uh, so, so, yes. So, I just wanted to encourage everyone to do that. Make sure, um, and you think about people who don't have kids um, able to do that as well. And reach out to people and share that with them. And share the hope that we have in that. So, um, if you guys will pray with me here. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thanks for us being able to gather and you reminding us in your word of how we should approach our parents and how we should approach people that are in charge of us. I pray that Holy Spirit, you would give us wisdom to distinguish between this honor, fear, respect, and the uh, almost sinful attitudes of enabling sin or disagreeing with people, um, you know, pugnaciously. I pray that. You would move our hearts and you would encourage us. I pray that you would be with the uh, parents that are isolated today. The Holy Spirit, you would calm their hearts and pray that you would help us to teach our kids and the next generation how to respect their parents, their guardians, those in charge of them, and that you would move those things in our heart to respect you. That you free us up to forgive people who need forgiveness uh, just for the mere fact that we are forgiven. So we commit this day to you. Pray that you help us to honor and respect you through honor and respecting other people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let we'll the worship team come forward. Um, I just wanted to mention, I can't remember if I mentioned, um, we of course have the box on the back for tithes and offerings. And then we have hand sanitizer space back there. And... Okay. And we've got Titus. <laughs> so just to remind everyone of that, and of course, if anybody needs prayer, um, I would be very happy to pray with you from six feet away. Uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, if you need prayer on something and give us something up, let's pray together.